Hello, and welcome to the National Park Service U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service FTEM training webinar. Uh, my name is Caroline Noble. I'm the technical lead uh, for IFTDIS and FTEM. Joining me today are Bree Schuler, also a um, technical lead with FTEM, and also Kim Ernst, another technical lead with IFTDIS and FTEM. Uh, Today's uh, webinar, we're going to spend about an hour. Um, the goal of the webinar is to give an overview of the new uh, FTEM functionality accessed within the IFTDIS application and um, allow a little bit of time for, for question and answers at the end if we have time. Um, you guys are all on mute just because there's a large number of participants and it minimizes feedback. Um, we are going to record this session, so you can let people know that if they couldn't attend and or if you want to reference <clears throat> the recording later. Um, you can be unmuted. Um, we may <clears throat> do that at the end with questions in the throughout the webinar. If you do have questions as we go along, please just type them in the chat box, and we'll have folks monitoring them. Uh, and if they're relevant to what's being demonstrated at the time, we'll we'll stop and address the questions as they come in. Otherwise, we'll save them for the end. Um, we also have uh, the agency field leads from the National Park Service and the Fish and Wildlife Service on the webinar with us. We have um, Mike Van Hemmelrick and Nate Benson from the National Park Service and Tate Fisher from the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. So. Um, at this point, Kim, can you unmute uh, Nate, Mike, or Kate and see if they have anything they'd like to say to the group before we get started? Certainly. Okay, Nate, you're unmuted, as is Mike. Hey, Kim, this is Nate. Yeah, it, Mike's the field lead, so he uh, can make any necessary statements. Mike, we unmuted you, so I don't know if you have anything you want to add. We think Mike's there. He's showing up, at least in the list. Give him another right. chance at the end if he's multitasking. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Right. Anything right. from Tate? Oh, let's see. Where's Tate? Sorry, I'll unmute Tate. Okay, here we go. Sorry, Tate, go ahead. There, I got you. Thanks, Kim. Hey, uh, just a reminder for Fish and Wildlife so folks, uh, like on the webinar invite that um, Kim Ernstrom did send out, um, this is kind of a show me for us. We're still uh, at this point in time using FMIS um, to record our FTM interactions, and uh, the national office is rolling those over into this program. Um, at least for the for the upcoming year. So I uh, appreciate that. Hopefully everybody enjoys this. Uh, um, we put a lot of work into this and uh, appreciate everybody taking the time to not only join in, but uh, the FTM IFTDIS folks for uh, doing the presentation for us. Great. Thanks, you guys. And, and uh, sorry, go ahead. Bye. No, I think Mike is raising his hand. So Mike, you're up if you want you're unmuted if you want to if you want to chat. Okay, maybe not. All right, we'll give Mike a little time right. later. Yeah, we can come back to Mike um as we go through. So yeah, without uh, further ado, you've all received hopefully a notification through your agencies about the recent release of FTEM or Fields Treatment Effectiveness Monitoring um, and the fact that it is accessible through the new, new IFTDIS application. Many of you have, have successfully navigated the process of logging in. Um, just a few housekeeping things with regard to how it, the accounts are structured and how uh, the applications are structured. Um, if this um, is being designed so that we can hang or connect other applications to it, and FTEM is the first thing that we've done that with. So 
you'll see on my screen how FTEM is available across the top of the application within the navigation bar um, within IFTDIS. So the idea is uh, a single sign-on. Once you successfully have an IFTDIS account, um, you can log into that and proceed to, to FTEM to do your work. Um, there is an initial setup of an, IFTDIS, or, uh, excuse me, an FTEM account required. Um, and like I said, many of you have navigated that. There are some basic roles and privileges associated with FTEM that your agency folks will probably uh, go through with you. But the main thing, uh, there's three main roles you need to know about. One would be uh, the administrators. And I can actually show you um, how that works. So the administrators are basically the regional leads for the fuels programs. Um, and they um, will be the ones that approve account requests coming in. So within um, the National Park Service, I can show you the list of those here shortly. Um, you guys hearing me okay? Yep, Kim? I can yeah. hear you, Caroline. Okay, my internet glitched there for a second. Um, the other roles will be FTEM um, editor, and that'll be the folks that actually do the data entry, um, enter the monitoring data, the same as um, your roles in the past, only it'll be in this new system. So that uh, role will be called editor. And then there's a role called uh, agency viewer, which is just um, someone who would like to view the data from the agency, but not necessarily do data entry. I don't know, are you guys seeing my screen? I seem to have lost my internet connection for a second. We got you, yeah, we can throw in. See that um, it's the IFTDIS user list. Okay, there we go. I'm trying to switch to the FTEM user. There we go. Okay. Yeah. There we go. So within here we go the FTEM user list. If I filter on National Park Service and agency administrator, you'll see that it's the national and regional leads for the program. So the responsibilities of these folks are to approve the editor requests. As they come in, we did give an agency administrator uh, a webinar a week or two ago um, that has been recorded. Um, we can assist people in getting those initial accounts set up uh, if they need any help. It's a one-time thing, so although it might seem cumbersome, um, once you're set up, you should be good to go. Um, and then the agency editor will be the folks in the field actually doing the data entry. Um, so a few, a few folks have gotten in there. And then agency viewer, would be more like a, a park superintendent or maybe the, the national folks who just want to see what's going on but wouldn't necessarily be doing data entry. So that's a quick and dirty of just um, how the roles and privileges work and account access. But once you uh, log into FTEM, you're going to land on a page that looks like this. There's two main sections, monitoring and reporting. Uh, today, I'll primarily be showing you uh, how the monitoring works, which is you know how you enter your data, the reports. I'll just give you a little bit of a demonstration on, and then there's help with account management, or you can return back to the FTDIS application. Uh, you'll see down here general guidance, which is actually um, the same guidance you've had in the past, maybe in a little bit more user-friendly format for um, as the questions come up for FDM monitoring, it's the answers to all the questions of the pick list of what you would choose in the various things. So it's just a sort of a guideline for, for what your um, parameters are for answering those questions. And then we have a pretty uh, robust FTEM help system that includes account roles, account setup, um, how to monitor your treatments, uh, again, guidance for um, specifics about answering those questions. We do have some FAQs populated, and we'll continue to populate those as people begin to use the system, um, and we get feedback on what is troubling to people and what is obvious, and then technical documentation. And the technical documentation, um, specifically if I open this up, this is where a lot of questions will probably come up because it's really all about the data with this application. So there's um, technical documentation on the sources for the treatment data, the sources for the wildfire data, um, how interactions are detected within the system, um, and again, so some FAQ. So keep in mind that those are available as a, as a first point as you're trying to understand um, where the data come from within the application. 
So once you get into uh, the application in FTEM, um, as you guys know, the, the whole purpose of this system is to uh, document interactions between wildfires and treatments. So the first place you'll go is to FTEM monitoring. And it'll automatically uh, open up into a split screen where there's a map on one side, and on the right, there's a list of wildfires. I currently uh, have an administrator account where I can switch agencies, but right now I'm on the National Park Service. And you can also pick wildfire year. So in this case, um, I've got 2018 selected because uh, the direction you all received um, from your agencies was to begin using this for 2018. There is 2017 available that you can go look at. Um, and Mike can clarify this at the end, but I believe um, your direction is just to, to work on 2018 fires, although you're free to go peruse the 2017 data. You'll notice that on the left of the map, um, there's a, a layer list that automatically pops up. It's color coded. Uh, this color coding is dynamic or interactive with this list of wildfires on the right. And what the colors mean is specifically in terms of um, FTEM monitoring. So red means that there's uh, interaction detected by the system and you need to check it. So not all NPS wildfires are listed here. What's listed is any wildfire that's suspected by the system um, interaction detection to have interacted with an NPS treatment. Um, once you begin monitoring, uh, those will turn into a yellow color to show that there's monitoring in progress. And once you've completed um, and submitted a report for them, they'll turn green. So this is a quick and easy way for, let's say you work in um, South Florida, um, a user can log in that's responsible for that area and go, oh, okay, look, I have all these fires I need to monitor, um, but I've finished the Anhinga. Um, and just so you know, this is I'm actually in a, a quality test environment right now to show these because we don't want to do any real monitoring for you guys. So I'll do some monitoring here during the demo, but um, the real site, we will not have touched your data. That's, that's up to you guys to do. There is something um, in your account if you go to your name. Um, there's something called a profile, and when you go in there, you can see both what your role is to make sure that, in my case, it's administrator, but to make sure you're an editor or a viewer or an administrator as you're supposed to be. And then there's a preferences section where you can set the map extent so it will auto zoom to your area of interest. Um, if you click on set new map extent, it'll ask you what agency you work for and what geographic area. And once you set that, it'll auto zoom you. Um, to your area of interest. Um, you can always change that or you can just use the um, the entire US. It, it, um, it's really a user preference kind of thing. So again, once you, you log in, my, my preferred extent is set to the whole United States. Um, you'll see this list of fires that need to be checked for monitoring and you'll see um, them listed in red because there's been a, a system detected interaction. So <clears throat> the way that the way this works is a little bit about the the um, wildfire data is the uh, data is pulled either from Irwin or GeoMac. Um, as you'll see as the wildfire list populates, um, it's got column headings here that gives the wildfire name, the acres of the wildfire, uh, the control date, um, the monitoring status, which refers to this, like I said, check for interactions in progress or complete. So it's called not started. Um, and then the number of interactions detected, and it's automatically sorted to the fires with the highest number of interactions on top. But these these are clickable so that you can sort, um, you know, by I could switch control date. And you'll notice that the control dates are all January 1st, 2018, uh, or later um, within there. Another thing to notice right away is that. Um, there's two layer lists for the wildfires. There's one called points and there's one called poly. Uh, so that has to do with the way that data comes in from the, the systems that we're drawing from. Um, we get the polygon data from GeoMac and the point data from Irwin. These are checked uh, and updated nightly. Uh, um, so it should be fairly current, but the, the uh, issue is it has to have a um, contain control or outdate before it comes into the system. You'll notice in some cases in this control date column, um, 
it's blank. And we also do have a fail-safe rule in place. If that is never populated in Irwin, we will bring in a fire uh, 45 days after the start date. So if, if nobody ever goes into Irwin to uh, contain or complete or declare out a wildfire, it will eventually make its way into the system, but it won't be there the next day, as you might expect. Some other things to notice uh, on this tab is that the polygon fires are denoted with this symbol, sort of a, looks like a square or polygon. Um, and then the flamies are just the fires that are represented as points. So in this case, even though, for example, this Canadian River wildfire was 1,500 acres, the only data that we have for it is a point. Um, and again, that's because it's not, then there's no um, polygon loaded up into GeoMap for that. So this is your list of fires. You'll notice that basically this is a, uh, there's four tabs across the top of the application and it's generally set up for you to proceed left to right. Um, so I picked a few example fires that we can walk through the, the process with that you'll navigate. You'll pick your wildfire. Um, in this case I picked, let's see, I picked one from South Florida to start with. I have about four different examples. Um, the context fire, so once you find your fire that you're interested in, you select the fire, and then you can say zoom to, um, and it'll bring you in uh, to a close-up map. This one's in the Everglades uh, with a sort of an aqua outline of the wildfire um, perimeter. Um, and then you'll have the option to um, turn on your treatments to see about the treatments associated with this fire. So when I click on treatments, I can either click on the, um, the tab that says treatments, or I can click on the, um, the tab header up here. Either way, two different ways to get to the same place. And now the NPS treatments are showing up, and these are pulled again from NIFPOR. So I've got the blue polygon representing the wildfire perimeter, and then I've got these two um, red symbolizations for these two different treatments. And it, it says uh, it's red, which means you know check for interactions, no monitoring yet done. So you can turn on um, and off these two different treatments and see where the treatments fall in relation to the wildfire. So in this case, this uh, context road um, broadcast burn from 2010 um, appears to definitely have interacted with the wildfire. Um, and in this case, this context road north treatment appears to be uh, just outside of the wildfire perimeter. So this is where, um, the local expertise comes in, and one of the reasons we can't do all of this automatically is we don't really know for sure um, which of these treatments truly interacted with the wildfire, and we don't know the specifics about the interaction. So the key to this treatments list is this is more um, the initial detection by the system. Consider it like a shopping cart in Amazon or something where you're deciding which treatments truly did interact and you want to report on as required by your policy and which treatments did not interact. So um, you can add and remove treatments here as needed. Uh, in, in this case, I'm going to, just for hypothetical, this isn't the real thing, I'm going to say, okay, this context road north didn't actually interact with that fire. It's just north of it. So I'm going to say uh, remove treatment. And I can say remove interactions. Um, and that'll pare the list down to just this one treatment that actually interacted with the wildfire. So at this point, I'm showing a pretty simple example of um, if you have pretty good data, you've got a polygon and a polygon, you can look at the map, look at your list. Um, similarly, you can click Add Treatment, um, and it will expand out further if you think that there's a treatment missing that you want to go look for. Um, it'll set a limit on how far I can search. I can say Find Interactions, and it, there's that context road north again. So you can see you're not really deleting that treatment from the database. You're just um, taking off of that, that list out of your shopping cart. So I could add that back if I wanted to at any time, but I don't necessarily want that one, but that's to show you guys how the add remove works. I'm gonna hey, Caroline, that one you, might, you might yeah, be ahead. covering this, but you might want to show them too how they can, they can click directly on the map to add remove. Yeah, thanks, Bria, I will. Um, so yeah, in addition to, um, these buttons that I just demonstrated, you can also go directly to the treatment. I, I could even go to this one um, and click on it. In this case, you'll see it's a point instead of a polygon. So for whatever reason, this treatment 
Um, I can click on it to get information about it. There's just a little bit of data associated with it here. It has a treatment ID from this forest that it was a broadcast burn um, and the date. And I could say add interaction here. And the same thing, I would say add treatment, and it would come up in this list over here on the right. So if, if for some reason that one did interact, um, we could always add it from there. Um, and that's another point is just this whole map, whether it's the wildfire or the treatments, you can use this identify tool um, to sort of drill down and, and get some additional information about either a given wildfire or a given treatment. So in this case, um, all the layers that I'm intersecting with with that point come up. So here's the name of the treatment um, with a little bit more data about it, the GIS acres, um, the fact that it's from NIF pores. And then if you scroll down, here's the information about the wildfire. So we've got some additional attribute information about the wildfire. So that's another way you can query this data to get a little bit additional information. Also, not to uh, <clears throat> show you too many things, but just so you have this as a reference, this application can go in split screen or full screen. It, it goes in split screen as a default because we find that people like to be looking at the map while, while they're working. But for both the wildfires and the treatments, you can always go to this little arrow up here that switches from half screen to full screen. And if I go into full screen mode with regard to these treatments, then when I hover over a given treatment, I get a little bit more information in what we call the, the right-hand panel. So some additional attribute information about that uh, particular tr treatment. Similarly, from the, the wildfire tab, if I do that and I hover over this wildfire, I will get um, the attribute information associated with that wildfire if I hover over it. So different ways to do things. And also within this screen, if you wanted to, you can filter. Um, on the status of a fire, whether it's not started in progress or, or whatever, and, and limit your list to that extent. Um, just to show you quickly, if I was zoomed way out, um, and I just wanted to look at, uh, I'm going to just get rid of the context fire for a minute. So I wanted to go look at just uh, fires that were completed, say, within this um, particular map extent. I could say completed. And you'll see that there's nothing there. Um, but if I say not started and I filter, here's all the fires that fall within the map extent that I'm showing that need to be looked at. So another way to filter this wildfire list um, to the area that you're interested in. So back to this context fire, you notice that the map continues to update to be um, dynamic with this list whenever I move around. So if I go back to the context fire, I go back to the treatments. Um, I'm going to remove that, that FY18 East Everglades treatment because I don't think it interacted. Um, so once you've refined this list of treatments to those that you uh, think truly interacted with the wildfire, the next step will be to actually monitor that treatment or answer the questions um, as you've done in the past with FTEM monitoring. So the way you do that is you select the treatment. Um, and you'll notice there are select all and deselect all options here. And then you proceed to either hit the monitoring tab or monitor treatment button to move to the next step. Um, and when you go there, it's going to bring whatever treatments you had remaining in your treatments list. And you can toggle back and forth as you refine that list. Um, it's generally expected to be linear, but it's OK to move back and forth from tab to tab. So once you come to monitor, you select the treatment that you want to monitor, and you can click Enter Data. And it'll bring up on the right-hand side a list of questions um, that are required for monitoring. You'll notice that uh, there's red asterisk next to questions. These are the required fields where you have to answer the questions, and these are also um, listed under this required, required fields um, header at the very beginning. So everything below this first box falls into the optional category. Not sure how you guys do this work, um, you know, in the past, but just to, to make it easier for you to remember which is required and which is optional. You'll also notice that in the case where we have uh, a polygon treatment and a polygon wildfire, the, the interaction acres are automatically calculated. So this is populated here to represent this intersection already. Um, that will only happen if you have uh, polygon to polygon. Um, you may have to manual, 
manually enter the number if you don't have a polygon. You just have a point representing either your treatment or the wildfire. Um, so these have pick lists, the actual required questions that are the same as the pick lists you've dealt with in the past. So um, in this case, we would say, say the wildfire burned through some of the acres treated. You'll have to populate the actual date of the interaction between the wildfire and the treatment. And this field is actually optional if you want to enter a time. Um, and then the three questions um, that you've populated in the past. Did the fire behavior change as a result of the treatment? Yes or no. Did the treatments contribute to control? Yes or no. And was the treatment strategically located? Yes or no. So you can go through and answer all these monitoring questions, both the required and optional, and say save, save and close, close and discard changes. And watch up here when I click save, um, you'll notice that this goes from uh, just a name to a, a three bars with a checkbox. That's the symbol for the fact that the monitoring for that treatment is complete. And you'll notice that the treatment now turned green. So it was red, um, meaning that it needed to be monitored. Now it's turned green because I've answered all the required questions. Um, if I had missed one of the questions, like I go back and uh, I don't know if I can undo that one. But let's say I, I forgot to put the date. When I say save and close, um, it should turn to yellow. So it's saying monitoring is in progress, um, but the it's not quite completed because I didn't populate that date field. So now it's yellow. So you can you can come back and forth. You can log in and log out and do this. You don't have to complete your monitoring all in one session. It's going to save all the edits that you do to each wildfire as you do them um, all the way through this phase of of entering monitoring data. So now when I come back in, you can see it's giving me a message. I've selected treatments that have already been monitored. Uh, previous responses may be overwritten. And you can say that's fine. And I'm just going to put in my date again. So there's save for that. The other thing to be aware of is that you can add attachments. Um, I should have pointed out you can do that uh, either from the wildfire tab or from the um, the actual treatments tab here. So from the treatments tab, if you click on attachments, it gives you the option to browse files to attach and you can attach PDFs, JPEGs, Word documents. Um, there's a variety of things you can attach. Um, and if you attach something, I guess I'll attach something just for fun, um, then you'll get a little icon that tells you that uh, you have an attachment associated with this fire. Uh, let's see. Attaching a soccer player in honor of the World Cup. Don't worry, this is just a test environment. So now you'll see when you do this list of treatments, there's a little paper clip here. Um, and you'll also notice that if you're back on the wildfire tab, there's also a paper clip here telling you that there's an attachment. You can go to that attachment and you can download it now if you want to. So if somebody else has put in a photo or a report, um, and say Mike wants to go look at it, he can go look at it and download it. Um, let's see, Bree, have I missed anything else before I proceed to the completion process? <clears throat> you might want to just show the table summary quick if you want. You could show the oh, right. complete tab too, though. No, that's a good point. Um, yeah, from, from this main wildfire tab, you can also click on something called table summary, which um, is available in a few places, but if you click on that, it's going to open a summary of all the data that's been entered for a particular wildfire. So it'll give you a little, little bit of information about the wildfire in the header. And in this case, since there was only one treatment that interacted, it just lists that treatment and it's a horizontal um, sort of spreadsheet-like connection of all the um, answers that you've given, including in the very last column, who did the monitoring for that treatment. So we've put the required questions at the start, the ones with the asterisk, and then the optional questions will all be populated here um, if you did do the monitoring. And that opens in a separate, separate tab. So yeah, there's also something called an audit log. You guys probably won't um, have access to that too much, but it can help us troubleshoot if there's problems and some of the administrative accounts have access to that to see 
um, what steps the user has taken um, in monitoring a wildfire. So once you get that monitoring done for that treatment, you might think you're done, but you're not really quite done yet. Um, hey, Caroline, that, can, I, I'm, can I jump in on one other thing? I'm sorry <laughs> that I thought of. Yes, yeah, free you. Um, before you before you complete. So <clears throat> I don't <clears throat> I don't know if you um, demonstrated why we allow people to bring multiple treatments over to the monitoring tab. Um, but well, part of that is, is because we do allow batch monitoring. So if you know that you're going to answer um, the bulk of the questions for a couple treatments the same, then you can select more than one. You can select as many as you need to <clears throat> and actually do some batch or bulk monitoring. So you can answer um, the questions the same for multiple treatments and save those all at the same time. So then you would um, potentially hammer out a bunch of treatments at the same time, especially for those big fires where you um, you might be able to do that. There are a couple fields that you have to answer as the treatments or you have to, to um, populate for individual treatments. We do not allow batch monitoring on every single field, but we do allow it on, on most of the fields you can batch monitor. Yeah, I'll, I'll try and remember to show that in another one, but here's a quick example. If you go to the buzzard fire, um, I'll zoom to that. I think that's some big cypress. Um, and you click on treatments, you can see that there's 28 potential interactions. I click on the treatment list. Um, now, I'm not going to go through and figure out which ones are appropriate, which ones are not, not right now. But if I say um, select all, and then I say monitor that entire list, will come over to the monitoring tab and then I can pick like if I know I could either pick all of them or I could pick these first three um, I want to monitor um, I'll say enter data I've got three of them selected and then when I come down here you'll notice there's a slight can, delay Caroline on the on the internet like okay oh. now we're caught up we're caught up okay so I selected three of those 28 treatments um, with check boxes. And when I go to the monitoring tab, uh, again, it's the same list of questions. Um, and the ones that are available for you to batch monitor are exposed here in white. And it's grayed out for treatment acres and time. So these are two fields that you can't batch monitor. The, the acres uh, of interaction, you can see that blue message says disabled when monitoring multiple treatments. And again, the same for the actual time that they interacted. So if you do have a bunch that you know you're going to say yes to all the required questions, you could you could at least do all those in batch mode, but you would have to individually go back to each treatment to populate the acres of interaction um, and the, uh, the military time if you choose to do that one. That one is actually an optional field. So thanks for pointing that out, Bree. Uh, so the next thing, I'll go back to the context fire. You can also search for your fire. It will only search within your map window. So I can type in context, but I'm going to have to zoom out a little bit. Um, it'll find the context fire. And like I said, even though if I'm in the treatments tab, it's green because I've done all the monitoring. In the wildfire tab, it's still listed as monitoring in progress. That lets you know that you haven't quite finished monitoring context fire yet. So the last thing that you need to do with this fire is you need to officially complete it. And that's what the fourth tab is. So when you go to the fourth tab, it's going to let you know um, there was one interaction. And it'll tell you the status of your interaction treatment data. So in this case, you've completed it. So I can just hit this button that says complete wildfire monitoring for NPS. Um, and that's what will actually uh, turn that green on the first um, menu on the wildfire menu. And again, from here, you can also still uh, access that table summary, or you can access the list of attachments, um, or go ahead and add something here. So there's multiple places you can do certain things, um, like the table summary and attachments. It doesn't matter where you do it from. So now when I go back to the wildfire tab, if I'm looking at my unit, seeing what I need to do, I can go, OK, I am completed the context fire, but I still need to work on this airport road fire. So. This is also handy for the, the higher level, say a regional FMO or even a national person. They can zoom out to a much bigger extent and immediately get a list of which fires um, to clear this search box. 
uh, have been completed and which ones still need monitoring so they can begin to um, remind folks in the field that monitoring still needs to happen for all these fires that are in red. So that's one example from the um, Everglades. I wanted to show a couple other examples just because there are some nuances to things you can encounter uh, with the data. Another example that I have, I'm going to switch to the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service for this example. And um, this one was called Mini Ranch. So it'll search this map extent for that fire. Actually, kind of know where it is, so I can zoom in. Sometimes it takes a minute, it's processing an awful lot of data as it's searching. Okay, so there it is, the Mini Ranch Road fire, a 300 acre fire with um, 300 potential interactions. You'll notice that the control date is not populated. If I'm curious about that, I can go to a full screen mode and look at the right hand panel. Um, and I'll notice that in this case, the control containment and outdates are not populated at all. So this is a situation where it took 45 days. That's what that field is called, the FTM end date. So if for whatever reason, uh, the local dispatch or the local unit is not updating things in Irwin, the fire will eventually make it in here, but it's going to be a 45-day time lag from the time the fire started um, to the time it shows up in this system. So if we go back and we want to monitor this fire, you'll also notice that it's represented by a flamey, not a polygon, which means that we only have a point associated with that fire, so a lot long for the point of origin, even though we know that it was a 300-acre fire. So I can select the fire, click on Zoom to, and it's going to zoom me um, to the point of origin being in the center of the map, represented by that blue aqua square. And you'll notice if you squint that there's also this aqua-colored halo um, or circle around that point. So this is how we um, take a first cut at finding interactions for fires with acreage for which we have no polygon data. So in this case, um, there's information in the help content about what that buffering is. It's dependent on the acreage. Um, it's a pretty reasonable buffering. You can see that there's three potential treatments listed here from Fish and Wildlife Service that may have interacted with this treatment depending on how accurate this um, estimation of the wildfire perimeter is. So I can say treatments, and I'll get a list of those treatments. Again, I can turn them all on on the map, but since they're all represented by points, again, the treatment data came in as points. Um, all we're going to see is these X's. So again, this is where the local expertise would come in, where the person that works on this unit would say, oh yeah, um, actually the fire went off to the northeast, and none of these uh, treatments actually interacted with it, in which case you would remove all the treatments, or however it might play out. Maybe this one interacted and this one didn't, so you just add and remove uh, treatments as needed from this treatments column. So I'm going to pause there. The purpose of this example is just to show what happens when we only have point data associated with that. Marie, do you have anything to add or any questions come in on that so far? No, no. <clears throat> no questions yet, and um, no, I don't. I don't have anything to add. Okay. Um, let's see. I'm gonna do another example, um, just to to do one more for fun. I've got one um, from Park Service in California. Um, that's a zoom layout. Well, searching for the in fire, which is I believe in. Um, Joshua Tree National Monument. So the map is rapidly trying to keep up with me. I got it right. Oh, I'm on Fish and Wildlife Service. Go back to Park Service. I think Caroline mentioned this, but just um, so just to reiterate that that agency drop down box that she's using in the upper right hand corner most of you if not all of you will not have that 
and that's just for the administrators. You'll, your agency is likely to be fixed um, to either Park Service or Fish and Wildlife. Right, thanks for, yeah, to make it a little easier on you guys. Um, there are some ways you can see other people's data. Remind me and I'll come back to the reference data in just a minute. So here for this example now, I found the in-fire. Um, it's a five acre fire with six potential interactions um, controlled in March. Again, this one's represented by a point because it's got a flame instead of a polygon. I can say zoom to, I'll go to that fire. And here you can see, here's the fire location. And it's a very small halo around it because it's only a five acre fire. So like I said, the, uh, the size of that buffer is in relation to the acreage of a fire. So now I'm zooming into that particular fire and I want to see what these six potential treatment interactions are. So I, I click on treatments. It zooms me out a little bit and I get the six uh, potential treatment interactions. Um, in this case, these are all represented, it looks like, by polygons. Um, if you'll notice, you'll start looking at these. They're all different um, treatment IDs and different treatments uh, with different dates. But if I turn them, zoom in a little bit, if I turn them on and off, it looks like it's the same um, footprint that's been reported on a few different times. Let's give the map a chance to catch up to me. So if I click on this first one from September of 2017 for 21 acres, which is the most recent, um, there it highlights that whole polygon. Similarly, if I click on this one, um, it highlights that whole polygon. So it looks like there was both a thinning and a chipping activity um, that occurred on this site. Similarly, if you go back in time to 2016, again it was the same piece of ground, or in 2015 it was the same piece of ground. So in this case, um, Mike can speak to it uh, further when we get to the policy things, but you guys don't want to be quadruple dipping and, and claiming this treatment a bunch of times. So the um, policy generally states uh, either the most recent treatment, I believe it's for the Forest Service or for the NPS, it's the one that had the most impact. So you as the local person would determine whether this thinning or this chipping was the treatment that you wanted to report on and you'd remove the rest of the treatments. So in this case, I'll just select all but one and I'll say um, remove treatment um, and I can remove those interactions. You also might notice that there's a, a gray dot. I just noticed that myself right here. So if we're curious about what that is and why it's not red, we can just click on um, that dot and say, okay, this is 3B headquarters thinning. Um, Friday, September 15, 2017. Uh, looks like that's duplicate again with the other ones, but if you're not sure, you could always say add the interaction, um, add it to your list, um, and sort of look into your records and NIFORs or whatever to make sure um, which treatment you want to report on. And again, if you want to report on both of them, if that's appropriate, you select both, go to the monitor tab, and here's where. As we pointed out earlier, if you want to select both and do some batch entering of the data, you can. You would click this, and again, when it's batch editing, the treatment acres and the time will be grayed out, but the other fields will be available for batch editing. So um, that's another example of where I think, especially with your NIFPORS data, depending on whether you're a lumper and a splitter and how you've entered that treatment data, um, you may get a bunch of duplication of the same treatment because it's coming in by a treatment ID and that's why they're all listed there. But you can use either the list mode or you can use um, the click on the map to get the attribute. Again, if you go full screen and you want to see more about these individual treatments, you can get a little information in the right hand panel as well to decide which ones to keep and which ones to remove. So Caroline, so we did have like, a question. We did have a question yeah, come in. Um, so Missy mm -hmm. had a great question regarding um, treatments that come into the system after monitoring has already started on a fire, and that could be that monitoring is in progress or completed. Um, if if NIFPOR feeds FTEM with new treatments after you've already started monitoring or completed monitoring on a fire, <coughs> our auto <coughs> excuse me our auto automated detection that we run every night 
will not rerun on that fire to pick up that treatment. Um, so, so you won't be, you know, it won't be pink when it comes in. Um, however, you can go to that, to your fire of interest and you'll see that treatment um, on the map where you can, um, as Caroline demonstrated, how to use the add treatments button to add the additional buffer to pick that one up. Or you can man manually just select on that treatment on the map and add the treatment um, that way. So you can add treatments that come into the system after you started monitoring. If they just won't be picked up by our, our um, auto detect that runs nightly. That's a one-time deal um, as of now. Thanks, yeah, that's a great question. So those were the example fires that I wanted to show for the monitoring process. I just want to get, show you guys uh, a wee little bit about the reports. So you can click on reports in your navigation bar to go to reports. Um, and or um, when you're at the landing page, you could go directly to reports. So when you, this is FTN reports. So when you get here, you can see the, the text description on the right. There's, there's five different types of reports available. And the one I want to show you today um, is this first one. It's called the FTM wildfire specific report. So as the name implies, this is specific to one fire. So if you select that one, select your agency, um, and then the, the start year for wildfires, then you can select build wildfire list. Um, or search, and then it'll auto-populate with all the fires that have been, um, have had monitoring completed through the fourth tab of that completion process. That's an important thing to note because people often go here looking for their fire. Um, this is where you can recognize, oh yeah, I didn't complete it yet, so it's not available in my pick list. So in this case, uh, since we're in a test environment, there are a few that I've completed just for demonstration purposes. I'll show you this Pinery Fire. This is from Chiricahua, I think. If I say generate report, uh, it'll go ahead and bring up a simple report, which has at the top of it uh, a, a basic map. Uh, well, I should, I guess, first say at the very top, there's header information, including agency information. Uh, a little bit of fire metadata um, coming in here, in, including the total treatment acres burned. Then you've got a map that shows you you're at Chiricahua, um, shows you the wildfire polygon and the treatment polygon. Um, and then you can scroll down and it's similar to that table summary where it's just got all the required and optional fields um, populated here in one report. So you can either scroll down or hit next if there's additional pages. And this report is downloadable. Um, I can download this as a PDF. I'll just show you this real quick. So if for some reason you wanted to, to show this to a park superintendent or somebody, um, you can generate an individual PDF for this wildfire treatment interaction. It'll list the name and the date, and then it'll have all the information I just showed on the screen. So the map, um, a little bit of metadata, and then the answers to the questions as they come through. So if there had been multiple treatments, they would all be populated below here. It's a pretty lengthy report just because we're fitting Excel data into a PDF. Um, you can also um, download um, to an Excel data sheet, or there's options here about just downloading the map as a JPEG as well, if you wanted that for some reason. So that's the main type of report uh, that you might be interested Initially, Bree, did you want to say something? Nope. Oh, I thought I heard you clearing your throat. So the other reports um, that are listed here, uh, and I can show you and you guys um, will be free to play with them, are summaries by agency, summaries by region, summaries by state, and then the FTEM data download. Um, and the reason I'm, I'm not trumpeting this too much is because since this is a brand new system, we have not pulled in the data from the legacy FTEM system, so all the data entered up to the release. Um, you won't be getting much in here. That's not um, incorporated at this time. So if, for example, I pull a state summary for Florida um, 2018, all we're gonna get is the two fires that I've done. And this is also the test environment, but the same will be true in the production environment. You only get whatever's been done since we released. So while these reports are 
of interest, certainly, especially down the road as we get more data in here. Uh, initially, we don't want people to come in here thinking that there's a bunch of data missing, uh, when in fact it's just because this is a new system. Um, the data download does download all of your agency's data for a given time frame into a spreadsheet, which uh, I think folks at many levels might find of interest, so that's something that's available as well. Again, it's not very populated yet, but as more, more and more data gets into the system, I think these will be of interest to you guys, and you can, you can feel free to play around with them. There's one thing just to point out, because um, you'll encounter it, but if you go to generate the wildfire report, like for the one I just did for the context fire, it takes a minute for the map to generate. So when you say generate report, you'll get a message, something like map is being generated. Yeah, uh, we'll load the image when it's ready. So you can either um, navigate away and come back in five minutes or sit here clicking refresh incessantly until the map comes up. Um, whatever is your, your preference, but that message will go away and the map will populate uh, when it's ready. So with that, I think I'm gonna pause and see what kind of questions are coming in and or if Mike um, wants to say anything or let Bree back clean up on anything that I've missed in this demo. Um, there are no additional questions. Um, I will reiterate that for FTM reporting, it's only fires that are in a complete state that will be able to be summarized in these reports. So if your fire is not showing up in FTEM reports, then I would go back to FTEM monitoring and make sure that you got all the way through to the complete tab um, and made sure that you clicked that to complete that fire because otherwise it's not gonna be summarized in these, these reports. Um, I also wanna mention, because I don't know if you touched on the fuel treatment data, the fact that that is with the wildfire data is also being updated nightly um, and for DOI that's coming from NIFPORS. So um, every night the system will, will read the NIFPORS feed and, and update as necessary. Um, and that data is being filtered. Um, there are additional filters put on that data um, as it's coming in. Um, it's only showing completed treatment um, in FTEM. And then the only other thing, Caroline, can you do you mind showing them how they need if they need to request additional roles, like if they're an agency viewer yeah. and they need to request editor access within their profile? Was the only other thing I jotted down. Yeah. So if you go to your I did that too quickly. You go to your name. You go down to profile. Um, here's my FTA. Oops. Don't look at that. My password's in there. Here's my FTM roles. Um, and then if you click on this add FTM roles button, you'll get this um, matrix of, um, I don't know if this is exactly how it looks to you, but you get the idea. You can say editor, um, and that'll be most folks that are either with a zone, um, you know, set of parks or at an individual park, and you're doing data entry, you'll be requesting the editor role, and then that will go to your respective regional fuels lead for approval, they'll get a note in their inbox, um, and it should happen um, pretty quickly. And, and we'll be monitoring the pending requests to make sure that, since this is new to everyone, um, that your accounts get approved in a timely fashion. So is that sufficient, Bree? Yep. The, um, with the data, yeah, yeah, but let me. Can I go back on the data because this? Yeah. These guys will be interested in this. So the, the source is NIFPORS and and we can unmute Justin if he wants to say something, but or, or Mike or Nate, but my understanding is so the Park Service maintains the NPS geo database, so all the data goes to um, Skip Adel, and then Skip periodically feeds that data into NIFPORS, so your sort of records are kept by Skip, and then Skip feeds it to NIFPORS, so there's a time lag um, between, and I don't know what that is, from the time where um, the regional folks say Justin gets it to Skip, and then Skip gets it to NIFPORS. We'll pull it immediately once it's in NIFPORS, but the frequency of skips updates to NIFPORS, I don't know, and, and maybe this might be a reason to request a little bit of increasing frequency um, to those updates, but that might be a first place to check if you see recent treatments um, not coming in. So thanks for that. So there was a question about that. Um, um, Diane asked, 
is there a way to modify polygons for treatment such as pre nif cores projects that are not correctly loaded into the system or do we need to go through the nif cores through nif cores to fix them first and i did type an answer but the, it is you do have to go back to your system of record um, and correct the data there um, the the nightly utility that runs to update um, the wildfire and the treatment data will pick up changes um, in the system. So if the treatment's already in the system and you go and make changes to it, it will read those changes and, and bring them in. Um, and so she says, great, she go through skip. Um, and then this yep. one, we might need to unmute Mike for Brian has a question. Is there a deadline for completing FTEM reporting for a, a fire season? Um, can you guys hear me now? Yeah, you're good, Mike. Yep. Go ahead. Okay, awesome. Um, yeah, there is going to be a, a deadline for completing it. Um, off the top of my head, I can't remember what that is. It's usually sometime after uh, the end of the fiscal year. But um, yeah, sorry for the technical difficulties on my end at the beginning. And I just uh, um, wanted to say thanks for everybody that's attending. I wanted to say thanks to um, uh, Caroline, uh, Bree, and, and Kim for all the work that they've done in uh, getting all of this put together. So um, thanks. Uh, just a couple other notes I wanted to make as we were going through, because um, Caroline had touched on it a couple, a little bit, um, and we are only going to be doing FY18 uh, fires and and uh, years past after that. So. You can look back at 17 if you want, but uh, that stuff's already been captured in the spreadsheet, so we can bypass that. And the other, um, when we are selecting uh, uh, treatments that are on the same footprint, we're, we're gonna do the same as the Forest Service and just go with the most recent. I think trying to figure out which one had the most impact is a little bit subjective. And we all know that it's uh, it's a combination of a body of work of all of the stuff that we've done. So if we just capture the most recent one, I think that's going to be uh, best in that situation. But all of this and uh, more is going to be coming out in detail um, shortly. We're working on uh, on MPS specific guidance, and uh, you'll be seeing that soon. I went to Alaska for you, Brian, but there's no fires needing interaction yet. Um, one thing I did forget to mention that I wanted to show you guys, this is consistent with IFTDIS itself, but if you're new to either one um, in your map, well, I should show the, the pre-populated layers that automatically come in consist of wildfires, points, and polys, and these aren't agency specific because we have to account for wildfires starting on another agency's land burning into um, park service or fish and wildlife service treatments. So these are these are all the wildfires. Uh, the treatments for the next two layers, and those are specific to the National Park Service or fish and wildlife, whatever you're set as. And then we do have a jurisdictional agency layer that's preloaded in here, as well as um, if you want it, the um, land fire, fire behavior fuel models, you just need to turn those on. Um, and off. And then uh, if you go down to this add layers button, there's a lot more reference data that's available if you wanted to look at additional um, information either to orient you or just out of curiosity um, of specific interest and unique to FTEM. All these layers here are the same as within IFTDIS, largely the same as what's within WFDIS. But if you go down to the bottom, you'll see that there's FTEM treatment polys um, and FTEM treatment points, and these are for other agencies. So we didn't really get into it, but you can. Um, some people serve in a dual role, either they, they work for both agencies and we can accommodate that. We'll do that with you uh, on case by case. Or there's fires that are impacted by, uh, or treatments impacted by a single fire that are both, say, Fish and Wildlife Service and Park Service. Um, in that case, when you go to your completion tab, you'll just complete for the National Park Service or the Fish and Wildlife Service. Um, and you can get your own report for National Park Service or Fish and Wildlife Service. You will get updates um, when your partner agency has completed their monitoring. You'll see it on the map. But if yours is done and theirs isn't, your process will not be held up. 
and let's say if I just want to look at say the BIA and the Forest Service treatments or something, I can turn those on and those will um, then come over here into my um, layer list and as I navigate around the map, um, those will be populated in, in my layer list as well. So that's something I didn't mention that you guys can, can play around with. Um, and lastly, there's also under other layers, there is a um, active fire perimeters uh, geomac. Um, so if you want to see emerging incidents in here, um, you can click on this. I, I don't know the exact um, update time frame for that. Do you, Bree? We just were talking about this yesterday about um, geomac fires coming in. Can you explain that better than I can? Um, sorry, I was looking at, I was answering a question in the chat, but I think I caught so so the, the geomac layer yeah. is working but it's it isn't showing I think the issue we were looking at yesterday is because I was looking at an inactive fire so that layer is only showing the active active um, perimeters but we should uh, or we, we're talking about bringing in the inactive perimeters as well because um, we think that could help users in cases where the geomac poly has not um, come into the system yet for whatever reason Okay, I've used up my one hour, so I'll just give it back to Kim if there's any last questions you want us to cover, Kim. Yeah, there's one. I just want Mike to uh, maybe revisit Brian's question um, about a deadline for completing reporting. And I know you mentioned for, you know, for seasonally or annually, kind of around the end of the fiscal year, and I imagine you'll be sending out information to, to folks to kind of give them that date. But what uh, we were trying to remember the um, the rule for a particular fire um it was we, we you were i think it's doi it's different from forest service and doi just so you guys know but um we thought it was 90 days after the, the fire is either called controlled or out or i can't exactly remember i'd have to look it up mike do you know off the top of your head you know i i, I don't that's that's a good question and i can't I can't remember because we've gone back and forth on it a few times. I can't remember exactly what we've settled on without uh, having that to reference. Okay, so maybe that's something to jot down and then just follow up with this group, maybe Mike, just to give them some of those um, those parameters for deadlines and such. Copy. Um, oh, sorry. Um, Jennifer had. Yeah, go ahead with Jennifer's question, um, Bree, and then at the very end here, Caroline, I thought if you could just quickly show the landing page and how to get to the help content. Yes. In case folks have questions, but I'll let Bray answer or Jennifer's question first. So Jennifer asked, um, at first I thought she was talking about the Zoom extent, but she asked why some of her fires for 2018 are not showing up yet, but others are, and specifically she was talking about Alaska. Um, just to note that when you're zoomed far way out, you're not going to see every single point and polygon of fires on the landscape. But as you zoom in, they'll start to draw. It's a rendering thing to speed the system up. And um, that's how we have the extent set. Um, but just to reiterate that your fires, you're not going to see your fires um, until it meets one of four criteria. It either, either has to have a control date, an out date, or a contain date and it's in that order so we're looking for control date first if there's no control date we look for an out date if it's got an out date we bring it in if it doesn't have an out date we're going to look for a containment date and if it's got a containment date we're going to bring it in but if it doesn't have all three of those we're going to start monitoring um inactivity on that fire in Irwin so if that fire goes 45 days without anyone updating any information on that fire in Irwin we're going to go ahead and bring it in so that's that's the criteria that these fires have to meet to be able to come into the system. Hopefully that makes sense. And there are some subtleties about different um, rural or remote units uh, not having the ability to get that data into Irwin. Um, I imagine that's Jennifer from Alaska and Brian. Um, we can always get with Andrew if there's something unique about the Alaska data and how it comes through Irwin. But, but um, yeah, um, we can follow up with you guys on that. So as Kim requested, if I go um, back to the FTEM landing page and I go to FTEM help, um, 
there's a couple of things. Um, one is if you're having um, you know questions about how to do things, you can go through this um, these different hyperlinks. Um, you can also go to um, if you're having trouble and you need to submit a ticket. Um, that would actually is that from Kim? Is that from um, you can do yeah. it from help within the application support. and request support um, and then submit a ticket. We also do have check the community or help center. Um, Kim, do you want to explain what you recommend in, in these areas? Yeah. So the first thing we're trying to do is um, submitting a ticket is sort of if you're if you're really stuck, if you have a bug, if you're locked out or there's something that's just completely not working. Um, we try to reserve a submitted ticket for that, but um, and instead we'd, we'd like you to go to the help center and use some of the help that we've created. There's quite a bit in there. It's fairly extensive and um, everyone so far has given us great feedback and has said it's very helpful. So we'd like you to try there first. Um, Check the community is a, is a set of, it's like a user forum. Um, we don't have a lot of FCAM stuff in there, of course, yet because we just released it. So. But you are welcome to post a question to the community forum, um, to the question and answer. Uh, there's two. There's a question and answer Q&A on the left-hand column there. And if you post a question there, usually we can get back to you right away. It also allows other users to see your questions, which is really helpful. That way, there can be a little dialogue. Other users can also chime in on the questions. It just doesn't have to be the um, FDDIS and the FSM staff. So. We're trying to make that sort of like a, a forum that people can share. If you have an idea for us, if you're seeing, if you're using FTEM or even IFTDIS and you've got an idea, um, the ideas exchange is a place to put those that type of information in. So, boy, wouldn't it be cool if if FTEM did this or if IFTDIS did this or that? You know, post that in there, and then we can let you know if that's on our development list or not. So, those are two other resources that we we're trying to get started and get people really using them. Um, and then, of course, the last resort is if, if you are really stuck, definitely submit a ticket, and we'll try to we'll try to work with you directly. We we usually are able to answer those pretty much right away. So um, we don't we don't deal with this stuff after business hours. We don't feel like field treatment planning is necessarily a fire emergency, but we will definitely get back to you the next morning at the very latest. So if it's during business hours, we'll usually get back to you right away. So. That's kind of how the support system works. And then, actually, Caroline, if you could go back to the um, to the landing page for FTEM, I just want to point out that there's a, a couple of things on there just so folks know where to find some phone numbers. And no, you're getting closer, Caroline. Keep clicking. How am I doing, Kim? Okay, you're, you're doing awesome. You're striking out. Um, <laughs> while, while Caroline's doing that, I'm gonna. Um, Diane had another question. She asked if a fire shows up gray, but there was an interaction with a treatment on the ground. Um, can you still go monitor it and complete it? And the answer is absolutely. So if you um, find your fire, but it's not, it doesn't have have a status, meaning the system didn't detect any treatment. Um, you can still definitely monitor that fire. Just select it and then uh, manually add the treatments that you want to to monitor for that fire. That's a good question. Oops. Okay, there we go. We're getting closer. I'm oh, getting there. Uh, Hang on. <laughs> I admittedly, it just does open a lot of tabs, and I got myself a little lost. Here I am. There we go. So this is our, our welcome page for FCAM, and you can see. Obviously, you can click uh, to get to the reporting or the monitoring section manage your account. And then this is where you can get other information. So um, if you if you need to get to some kind of frequently used topics here on the get information section, um, you've got the guidance on data and entry, learn how to use FTEM, et cetera. And then just go to the help, which is the larger help content. And then we're, we're in the middle of posting guidance um, there for each agency. So Caroline, if you can go back to that landing page again. Um, I hope so. You can, uh, there you go. So read agency guidance. Right now we don't have, um, uh, we've got BLM linked and Forest Service linked. And if, if, if additional guidance we get from Mike and from the Fish and Wildlife Service, 
eventually comes along, we will post it there. And that'll take you directly to um, to the agency guidance. And then, of course, phone numbers for folks and who the primary contact for F10 is for your agency. So, um, and then if we have anything to announce, if there's a new announcement or something we want to let users know, this last column, in this case, we've got something about missing data right now. Um, we will post sort of news and information on that too. So um, you come to the uh, Welcome to F10 page every time you log in and definitely take a look at what's on here in case we've updated something or um, added some more information for you. Yeah, that's all I Thanks, got. And I, yeah, I that's all I have. As well, and I know we're a little bit over time, so. Well, thanks, everybody. We look forward to uh, feedback and let us know um, if if you have trouble accessing your account or if you have questions. Um, we'll be glad to help. And get a hold of Mike and uh, the backup, Nate Benson, in case you guys have specific questions for agencies, and then Tate, of course, for Fish and Wildlife. So oh, one last, one last one. Um, Justin asked. Wildfire polygons only come from GeoMac, not the agency's um, geodatabase, and that is correct. They are only coming from GeoMac. And with that, I think we can say we're done. <laughs> Thank you, everybody.